Welcome back. We are uh, traveling to Britain, the British Empire, and how they, th this video is, how did the British Empire rule the world? So I'm very fascinated in that world leaders, countries that, you know, expanded so much, um, you know, like Rome, uh, the Napoleonic Wars, you know, all, all that. So anything history and um, there's always, there's always stuff to learn. There's always more that I just did not know about the expansion and contraction of the countries <clears throat> and why that is. So I'm gonna look into one of my favorite countries, um, world exploration and uh, expansion and see what I could learn. So this is by Knowledgeia, Knowledgeia, Knowledgeia. Um, <clears throat> yeah, here we go. Let's, uh, let's see what we could learn and uh, the, the good, bad and the uglies. The British Empire may not have technically ruled the world, but it was, in fact, the largest empire to exist at any point throughout history. Well, that's sinking right there, too, because it's... <clears throat> you always hear about the Roman times, and, and, and when you compare Romans or the... Probably the Mongols, too. Mongol Empire got really, really big. Um, but this is just, just crazy with land size and population. I think the population comes from India, the land size comes from, you know, Africa and, you know, Australia and Canada for sure. So, and how they did it so much later in time compared to other empires from back in the hundreds of years before this, I think I could be, they'll say this, but I could be wrong with the time. It's something like um, just before World War One, maybe was like their, their peak um, or like late 1800s. Probably like late 1800s, but this is probably this map, and I know they'll say it, and then bam, I'll learn it. But it's just impressive that way back in the day, you hear of all of these conquests: Alexander the Great, you know, um, Napoleon, Caesar, the the Huns, all that stuff, uh, the Mongols, and um, not not the Huns, the Mongols, and um, they just conquered so much, and they're so you know devastating at times, but also you know, expanded the world and pushed the world forward in some ways, um, especially like Rome and their technology, um, technology, um, and just the good things that they brought the world. I know there's a lot of bad too, but, um, this was, this happened like hundreds of years after all these conquests and they got so massive. It's just kind of interesting to see, but I guess they had a lot more access to, you know, world maps that they actually had. And they're really stitching the world together and finding out all these new lands. Reaching across the globe and carrying on over multiple centuries, the British Empire owes its success and ability to expand so widely. The geographical position of Great Britain served as a major advantage to the growing empire. Given that the nation was an island, mm -hmm. the likelihood of being invaded or conquered was somewhat lower than a country that was surrounded on all sides by foreign powers. Yeah. Although Britain was not completely immune to incursions, both in terms of external threats and when it came to any border disputes. Britain had a pretty clear and straightforward border between itself and any other nations. While Scotland and England split the landmass that was bilaterally united with the ascension of Scotland's King James VI to the throne of England in 1603, both states would together make up the nation of Great Britain by 1707, sharing their outward borders with nothing but the North Atlantic Ocean and the North Sea. This open position, with easy access for maritime expeditions, also gave Great Britain an upper hand when it came to reaching other countries and continents. Needing only to cross over foreign land when they wished to reach countries more inward on their continent, the Brits were able to sail to just about any coastal nation without much resistance. Still, oceanic adventures would not have been so effortless for the British Empire without a strong naval fleet. Yeah, I mean, they had to. They're, they're a huge country back in the day, and 
you know, if they didn't have a, if they had a weak Navy, they could just be invaded from anywhere and they couldn't really do much about it. And then with that, the, the strongest Navy, I'm sure at the time, you know, along with a few other countries, I think like Portugal and, you know, probably France, um, maybe Spain, the, the Netherlands, I'm not sure exactly, but that's, that's the, the, the powers that you hear about with good navies uh, back in the day. But if they didn't have that, they would just be invaded left and right, I feel like. And then with that power, especially during maybe more peaceful times, they'd explore so much. And that's that's exactly what they did. On a side note, this map makes me want to play uh, like a Total War game. This is where the size and power of the Royal Navy became a center point of British success. While Great Britain did not always control the world's oceans, the reason they began to skyrocket as an unignorable maritime power by the 18th century is largely due to the fact that they invested more money in ships and guns than other naval forces. The government and citizens of the British Empire truly believed that the future of their wealth was to be found through the ocean. Recognizing the importance of overseas trade, as well as a fleet that could also defend their land if ever required, the Brits made sure to adequately fund the Royal Navy. The Empire's focus on trade additionally contributed vastly to its triumphant transcontinental growth. Intent more on gaining wealth and increasing trade than on consolidating power through conquest, the Brits were able to create a more desirable environment for others to become a part of. After the successful colonization attempts in North America and the West Indies during the 1600s, the British Empire began to establish a commercial system that allowed for exponential success within Great Britain and its overseas territories. Colonies were granted monopolies for their products in the British market, and therefore were to conduct trade via British ships. In 1651, the Navigation Act would prompt the development of a closed economy between the empire and its colonies, thus creating a system where all colonial imports were required to come from Great Britain and all colonial exports were to be sent directly to the British market. I mean, and that, that works really well for them because they're seems like always at war with someone, um, especially France. Now they have all these these resources going straight, funneling through them, and then they kind of figure out what what they want to do. And it was so uh, rich with minerals, I feel like, over here, and, and foods, and, and so much more. So they probably heavily benefited from that. By the way of British ships. During the same century, the British East India Company was established as a means of... I want to do a video on that. That, that blows my mind of how big the East India Company was i think maybe it maybe i read it wrong but it was something like the biggest company ever developed ever uh made like with inflation everything it was just it was an absolute monster of a company and you could see you could tell by these times i mean trade finally just explodes so it, it makes sense trade between great britain east asia southeast asia and india Initially focused on the spice trade, the East India Company later incorporated other goods such as silk, cotton, tea, opium, and more. Politics made its way into the company later on, despite the origin being purely based on establishing more trade opportunities. Driven limitlessly by the concept of controlling a global trade market, the British Empire continued to extend its reach across the continents of Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, and the Americas. So growing and growing While the process growing. of colonization varied from territory to territory, one thing that remained consistent was the form in which these expeditions began. Unlike other empires who chose to expand through the use of military might and sovereign claims to power, the British facilitated most of their expansion through the establishment of trading posts and systems. Nonetheless, the British Empire was not a completely non-violent authority. On top of the Anglo-Dutch and Anglo-Spanish wars near the start of British expansion, the Empire also engaged in conflict with its American colonies during the American Revolutionary War, later followed by the dissension in India, succeeding the decline of the Mughal Empire, and leaving the British East India Company as a prominent political power in the region. 
The presence of Britain in India was also notably more forceful than some of their other trade-focused enclaves. Demonstrated by the expansion of the East India Company's power through the threat of violence against those who protested. The continued tensions between the British and French were no longer secluded in India either, as the Seven Years' War erupted in 1756, lasting until the Treaty of Paris was signed in 1763, leaving Britain as the leading power across India and the world's oceans. When the American Revolutionary War came in 1775, after the British Empire responded to the No Taxation Without Representation movement of the Americans by sending troops to try and subdue the colonies, France and Spain chose once again to go to war with Britain, now as allies of the newly declared United States. In 1783, oh, guys, at the Peace of Paris, the British Empire was forced to acknowledge American independence, in turn relinquishing any control over their former colonies. Devising a new strategy after such a drastic loss of territory, Great Britain now turned its attention toward the continents of Asia, Africa, and Australia, marketing what some historians call the beginning of the Second British Empire. Though trade between the United States and Great Britain actually continued after the installation of independence, the Empire chose to utilize the uncolonized coasts of Australia, which had been discovered by a Dutch explorer, Willem Janzoon, in 1606, and later claimed for the British Crown by James Cook in 1770 yeah, under the Cook. name of New South Wales. Still feeding their fresh craving for expansion in South Asia, the British suddenly engaged in a series of conflicts after the Battle of Plassey, which had occurred in 1757. By 1774, the British Empire took on a chain of attacks. The anglo missor Wars were fought until 1799. That's what I've heard. It's like, I feel like Britain and... Uh... And India never really had the best, I don't know, like conquering uh, experience. I don't know. It's not a good way to put it. But like they said, a lot of places, most places, they would expand through trade. And that's how they would it'd be generally you know, peaceful. Um, maybe peaceful, but not, not like wars like this. India was, uh, I feel like, a whole different story, a whole different way that they, they tried to, you know, really conquer... Um, conquer them india so yeah it's something else that i'm not overly familiar with but it seems like generally they were they were um expanded through trade and then other times you know this would happen followed by clashes with the pindaris attacks on places like sindh and burma also accelerated the new consolidation efforts of the british east india company on top of what was referred to as the doctrine lapse where the Brits forbid the ascension to the throne of any Hindu ruler if they were not the natural heir. Once the current Hindu leader either died or was removed in some way, the British would occupy his state and gain control. These acts That's by the British Empire, well. combined with other forms of forced westernization of the Hindus, led to the Sepoy Mutiny of 1857 to 1859. Tired of the current heavy-handed British rule, the Indian troops of Meru sparked a rebellion that would spread throughout the nation. Peace was finally declared in July of 1859, and the British East India Company was scrapped. Although the empire maintained a... So for comparison, I think that's like right, right around when the American Civil War was happening. I think it was like 1855. I hope I'm right with that. Some, something close like that. So it's just like kind of uh, to connect the two events, it's kind of right around that time as well. Level of control under the, the crown until 1947. During this span of time, Great Britain set about making its presence better known in Africa as well. Although the Royal African Company had been established back in the 17th century, finding ample profit in the slave trade until its abolition in 1807, it was not until the 19th century that the Brits realized the potential benefit of forming a trade route across Africa. 
with its eyes set on establishing outposts spanning from Egypt down to the southern half of the continent, the British Empire found itself in a race against the other growing European powers, such as Italy and Germany, which eventually led to the Berlin Conference. The conference, which occurred in 1884, was intended to create some harmony between the competing colonizers. Great Britain was ultimately awarded most of northeastern Africa and all of southern Africa, Dang. meaning that at its peak in yeah, the continent, wow. the British Empire ruled over approximately 30% of the African population. Africa is, is massive. It is so big, too. It's, it's crazy. Globally, it's at the of height land. of Britain's domination, it controlled roughly 22 to 25% of mm -hmm. the world's land surface. Wow, look at that. Did they say the year? I hope they said the year. I want like a little timeline on the bottom. And just mostly through, you know, trade. And by 1938, governed around 20% of the world's population. This remarkable prosperity was accomplished through a geographical advantage, supreme naval might, and the strategic focus on trade and wealth over bullish sovereign power for the sake of an emperor. All right, well, <clears throat> that, that's it. I mean, what, what year did he say again? Um, 1920s? And of the world's populations. And by 1938, governed around 20% of the world's population. So 1938, I was, I was a little off. I was thinking earlier. Um, Man, 1938, that wasn't even long. Like, the in the grand scheme of things, that's not even too long ago at all. I mean, our, our, a lot of our grandparents were, were alive at the peak, peak of uh, the British Empire, which is very weird to think about, but uh, impressive as well. I want to see... So, that's wild. Let's see. Um, the Civil War... I said, oh yeah, I, I was off. Right after I said uh, 1855, I'm like, no, I think it's 65 it ended. So a little off, but yeah, roughly around the same time, all this expansion and these wars and, and India, um, these conflicts were, were going on roughly around the same time um, as the American Civil War, 61 to 65. Yeah, and that's, that's just impressive. Look at that map. huge i don't know how such it's always impressive to me that it's such a small i mean back then i'm sure it was a big country but just like just in the grand scheme of things with the, the whole world such a small country with only so many people so many ships can't rule over this much but like they said the um east india trading company was seems like influenced a lot through their trade they got a lot of, they expanded, they made um, ports and cities and everything. So through that way, through more peaceful means uh, some of the time, that's also how they expanded and kept their grip for a while. Um, I want to look at the East Trade, it's the East India. East India or East India Company. Founded 1600, wow, pretty, pretty much 1601. Um, defunct in that that's wild because I, I always wondered if the east india company it, it was just so big maybe i'm thinking of the dutch east india company is that what's the difference what am i looking at here dutch east india company so it was made like a year two or two after it was defunct a little earlier what's the difference east india company Dutch East India Company. One's just Dutch, one is English, I guess. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, Amsterdam, Netherlands. So maybe I'm thinking of that, that, uh, that company. Regardless, it, it is pretty wild. And I wonder what happened to, because they both were, I feel like, so, so massive back in the day with this explosion of 
of trading around the world. Um, lots of trading at that time, a lot of exotic things moving around the world and um, food and livestock, everything. So I wonder what happened to these, are these companies still around today? I know it has a different name. They probably got broken up. They'd be called monopolies, etc. But are they still around today in some form? I could only imagine that w with their power and wealth, and I'm sure they bought companies, where are they today? Like, is it a trading company? It might not be wonderful today, or did they break off into oil? It's just something like that. So that's always a, I'm going off topic, but I've always wondered where are these massively powerful companies today? Did they break off? Did they become something else? But it seems like they really helped not the Dutch East India Company, but the uh, East India Company, um, the expansion with all these trade routes, with all these port cities of the British Empire. So I'm going to do a video on that now. I always get too excited and start watching more videos. So thanks for watching. Um, add any information you can to this because I want to learn more. I know there's so much I need to watch, you know, whole documentary to like kind of start grasping this this whole concept um, of the expansion of the uh, British Empire and once again it's just so amazing that they did it so I guess late in time um, but also it makes sense with their their broader knowledge of the world and their maps that they had compared to back in the day with Napoleon and Alexander the Great and the, the Mongols etc so yeah, I will do more of these. Thanks for watching. Add anything. I want to have a conversation about this. And until next time, thanks for watching.